What's up, people? I'm reacting to Napoleon's masterpiece, The Battle of Oxlitz. Let's get right into it. An epic history TV, History March collaboration, supported by our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. In December 1804, in the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, Napoleon Bonaparte crowned himself Emperor of the French. Damn. Europe had never seen such a sudden and dramatic rise to power. A son of impoverished Corsican nobility hmm. to military dictator of France in little more than 10 years. <laughs> Revolution and war had cleared Napoleon's path to the throne. War would dominate his 10 year reign. A conflict unprecedented in history that would leave millions dead continent in turmoil. Jeez. The Napoleonic Wars, part one. Otzlitz, 1805. Eight months after Napoleon's coronation, the French Empire and its Spanish ally were at war with Britain, hmm. and Napoleon had assembled an army of 180,000 men along... Look at this map. Completely different from today. Isn't that freaking insane? the Channel Coast. But as long as the British Royal Navy ruled the seas, invasion was impossible. Hmm. But nor could... <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> oh, my. Okay, so I guess, like, the British is, like, freaking on, you know, they own it, and the French are like, damn. But damn, this is quite the illustration. Britain challenged France on land. Mm. And so British Prime Minister William Pitt tried to build a European coalition against Napoleon hmm. using diplomacy and gold. So they use, they call him Boney? Okay. <laughs> the, the car, the Corsican ogre. <laughs> Perfidious Albion. Britain would prove Napoleon's most steadfast enemy mm. and its press delighted in relentless mockery of the French emperor. <laughs> Britain and France were old rivals in Europe and overseas. Mm -hmm. But now, Pitt feared Napoleon's conquests had made France too powerful. The French emperor had to be defeated. And Europe's balance of power restored if there was ever to be lasting peace. Mm. Pitt found willing allies in Europe among monarchs who despised Napoleon. So we got, like, um, Alexander I, uh, the first of Russia. We got Ferdinand the fourth of Naples. We got Gustav the fourth, Adolf of Sweden. Interesting. Okay, so essentially they said this guy's too powerful, we gotta calm him down. And willing allies in Europe among monarchs who despised Napoleon as a product of the French Revolution and a dangerous threat to the existing order. Mm. Austria harbored the deepest grievances having seen her influence in Germany and Italy hmm. steadily eroded by French victories. Ooh. The final straw came in May 1804, when Napoleon had also crowned himself King of Italy in Milan. Ooh. Austria, Russia, Sweden and Naples joined Britain in an alliance known as the Third Coalition hmm. and devised an ambitious plan for a series of joint offensives against France. Whoa. The main attack would be made by a combined Austro-Russian army mm -hmm. advancing across the Rhine into France. Hmm. But Napoleon got word of their plans and reacted with typical speed and decision. Whew. He was determined to strike first before the Allies could join forces and ordered his army now renamed La Grande Armée, to march to the River Rhine. Mm. His target was the Austrian army of General Mack, huh. which had made a premature advance against Bavaria, a French ally. General Mack! <laughs> and was now dangerously isolated from the other Allied armies. Mm. Napoleon ordered Marshal Murat his famously flamboyant cavalry commander right. to make faint attacks through the Black Forest, mm. while the rest of his army, advancing at speed, enveloped Mack's army from the north. Mm. That summer, 
Napoleon's Grande Armée was at its most formidable. Well-trained, highly motivated, its regiments at full strength. What's more, it had been newly reorganized according to the Corps system, later imitated by virtually every army in the world. Wow. Each Corps, commanded by a marshal, was a mini-army of 15 to 30,000 soldiers, mm. with its own infantry, cavalry, artillery, and supporting arms, such as reconnaissance, engineers, and transport. This meant each corps could march and fight for a limited time independently. Bro, he was essentially raising many armies within his army. Like, he revolutionized the way the war was fought. Allowing Napoleon to break with the old doctrine of keeping his army concentrated and advance with his corps widely dispersed. Wow. This helped to disguise his real objective mm. and increased movement speed because the army could advance along multiple roads and live off the land. It's like army shadow clone jutsu, man. Taking its supplies from scattered villages rather than relying on slow moving supply wagons. Mm. When the enemy's main force was located, the army could quickly concentrate for battle. This is how Napoleon's army was able to move at a speed that often surprised and disorientated his enemies. Mm. Mac didn't realize the danger he was in until it was too late. Woo! Napoleon's fast-moving corps crossed the Danube behind him and surrounded his army. Oh my gosh. Mack launched a series of poorly coordinated counterattacks, but despite some desperate fighting, the Austrians couldn't break out of the trap. Mack hoped that Kutuzov's Russian army could arrive in time to save him, mm. but the Russians were still 160 miles away. Ooh. And so, at Ulm, on the 19th of October, just six weeks into the war, Mack surrendered his army to Napoleon. Oh. The French took nearly 60,000 Austrian prisoners, and Napoleon had struck his first devastating blow against the coalition. Wow. Russian General Mikhail Kutuzov was an experienced and wary commander, hmm. more cautious than Mack. His army was exhausted after its 900-mile march from Russia. Hmm. But hearing of the Austrians' surrender at Ulm, and knowing he wasn't strong enough to face Napoleon alone, hmm. he immediately ordered a retreat. Very smart. Napoleon pursued. <laughs> The Russians fought several sharp rearguard actions, but could not save the Austrian capital, Vienna, mm. which the French occupied on the 12th of October. Mm. Kutuzov slipped away to Olmutz in today's Czech Republic, mm. where he was joined by reinforcements, as well as Emperor Alexander of Russia and Emperor Francis of Austria mm. in person. Napoleon was furious that Kutuzov had escaped. Mm. By now, his army was also exhausted and far from home with winter approaching. Oh my gosh. He needed to force a decisive battle mm. quickly. Fortunately for him, the overconfident 27-year-old Russian emperor Ooh. sought the glory of battle, overriding the concerns of his veteran commander, General Kutuzov. We got, uh... <laughs> A fellow Dagestani warrior over there. <laughs> With the Allied army closing in, Napoleon ordered his corps to rapidly concentrate on a battlefield he had carefully selected mm. near the town of Austerlitz. <laughs> Napoleon oversaw the dispositions of his army late into the night, mm. then grabbed a few hours sleep beside a campfire. Mm. Dawn would mark the first anniversary of his coronation as emperor and promised a battle that would make or break his young empire. Folks would just sleep anywhere. On a chair, over there, anywhere. <laughs> with a thunderclap. Let us finish this war with a thunderclap. The morning of the 2nd of December, 1805, was cold and bright with a heavy mist. Mm. 
two armies of near equal size faced each other across a seven mile wide battlefield. Mm. But the Allies held the high ground of the Pratzen Heights, mm. while French Third Corps under Marshal Davou was still marching to the battlefield. Mm. Seeing Napoleon's thinly stretched right flank, oh. the Allies planned a large scale attack from the Pratzen Heights oh my to God. steamroller the French right before swinging round right. to envelop Napoleon's army. Mm -hmm. Little did they know, Napoleon was counting on his weak right wing luring the Allies into just such a move. Wow. Whereupon he would launch his own attack on the Pratzen Heights mm. to cut the Allied army in half. Whew. His bold plan relied on his correct prediction of Allied movements, the speedy arrival of Davout's Third Corps on his right, mm. and a perfectly timed counterattack. The battle began around 7 a.m. as Austrian troops of General Keinmeier's advance guard clashed with French troops defending the village of Telnitz. Mm. Wow. In the face of overwhelming odds, the French fought stubbornly and bravely, but gradually they were forced back. Right. But the Allies, instead of carrying out their great enveloping attack, did nothing. The morning mist and the late arrival of orders had led to confusion and delay. Oh. And it was another hour before the first three Allied columns were on the move. Mm. Soon, fierce fighting erupted around Sokolnitz's village and castle. <sighs> Marshal Davout's corps, which had just force-marched 70 miles in two days, mm. now arrived to strengthen the French right wing. Oh my God! Around 9 a.m., his lead infantry brigade appeared suddenly through the mist. That is not just like, that's lucky as well. You know what I'm saying? They had luck on their side simultaneously with like decisive action. Three took Telnitz before being driven back in turn by Austrian hussars. Mm. Two more of Davout's brigades reinforced French troops at Sokolnitz. As the mist began to clear, Napoleon saw that, as he'd hoped, the Allied left was moving off the Pratzen Heights. Mm. And he ordered Marshal Soult's 4th Corps mm. to begin its attack. To the alarm of Allied commanders, two French infantry divisions, until now hidden by the mist, mm. were suddenly seen advancing straight towards the Allied center. <laughs> that was General new. Kutuzov was forced to hurriedly organize a defense of the heights using troops of four columns. Dude, that must have been terrifying. Like, you're just in the mist, you're like, there's somebody there, and it's like, with horses and shiesty. Two hours of bloody fighting followed. Musket fire was so rapid and furious that both sides were soon low on ammunition mm. and turned to the bayonet. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Back then they had the muskets, right? So I, I'm assuming they're freaking loading it. The same thing with the cannons, they loading it, boom, loading it, boom, loading it, boom. And then when that runs out, they're like the bayoneta, they're like freaking just using long swords essentially, almost like the freaking Macedonian, you know, phalanx. And then they're just like, you know, stabbing each other from a distance. Huh, see it from far. By 11 a.m., the French, with the advantage in training and discipline, had secured the heights and driven a deep wedge into the Allied position. Man. To the north, a giant cavalry battle developed. While a Russian force from General Bagration's advance guard captured the village of Bosenitz mm. before it was halted by cannon fire from the Santon Hill. Mm. A decisive charge by six regiments of French heavy cavalry mm. finally drove back the Allies allowing Marshal Land's Five Corps to move forward right. and seize Blasovitz and Krug. Mm, amazing. Now, Grand Duke Constantine, commanding the Russian Imperial Guard, led forward this last Allied reserve oh my God. in a desperate bid to reclaim the Pratzen Heights. No way. No way. A battalion of the French 4th Line Regiment was charged down by Russian Guard cavalry losing its eagle standard in bloody fighting. 
Whoa. Napoleon, who'd moved up to the heights, sent in his own guard cavalry. In this grim melee between the elite horsemen of both armies, the French finally prevailed. Wow. And it was the bayonetta, just the bayonetta, because, like, you know, a lot of times, people just run out of anim like ammunition. <laughs> Damn. Can you imagine just, like, you were the army with the AR-15s back then? You'd be, like, king of, you know what I'm saying, everywhere. Napoleon had broken the Allied center. Now, to close the trap on the Allied left wing, still locked in heavy fighting around Sokolnitz. Mm. Around 2 p.m., Napoleon oh. ordered four divisions to swing south and cut off their retreat. Retreat! General Buxhauden, commanding the Allied left, only now saw the danger he was in. Mm. Attacked from three sides, the only escape was south. Many of his troops were forced to flee across frozen ponds. Oh my god. French artillery opened fire, trying to smash the ice with their cannonballs. Ooh. About 200 men and dozens of horses drowned in the freezing water. Oh my gosh. But not the many thousands of Napoleon's propaganda. The French Emperor had won a brilliant victory. His army had taken more than 10,000 prisoners and captured 45 enemy standards. Thousands of dead and wounded of all sides littered the battlefield. Many left untended for days. Man. The Battle of the Three Emperors, as it became known, was a crushing blow to the Third Coalition. As Russian forces retreated back to Russia, Francis I of Austria was forced to accept a humiliating settlement with France, agreeing to pay a 40 million franc indemnity and give up more territory in exchange for peace. Ooh. But meanwhile, news had reached Napoleon of a disastrous Franco-Spanish defeat at sea off Cape Trafalgar. British Admiral Lord Nelson at the cost of his own life, had masterminded a victory so complete that it ensured British naval dominance, not just for the rest of the war, but for the next 100 years. Oh my gosh. Britain, master of the sea. Napoleon, unbeatable on land. Wow. The whale and the elephant, neither able to challenge the other in its own domain. <laughs> Oh. When William Pitt received news of Napoleon's victory at Austerlitz, he's supposed to have said, roll up that map of Europe. It will not be wanted these ten years. Hmm. A month later, Pitt was dead. But his warning that Europe faced another ten years of war and upheaval was to prove prophetic. Oh. Napoleon Bonaparte was the ultimate disruptor of European history. One man who transformed a continent. If you want to find out more... Man, are you serious, dude? That's freaking insane. That's insane. Like, this guy, I've never seen a, a, a commander do what Napoleon did. He had to be the most brilliant. Like, Alexander was in, incredible, but this guy was fighting, like, I mean, out of allied forces. I mean, the Persians were allied, but... Not like this. Damn. He was just like, you know, it was just unison. He was just killing it, man. Like, look at that. Huh. Come on, bro. We, we can't complain. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being around during these times? Like, we got it good, dude. Um, if you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe. And um, hope you're having a beautiful day. And I'm going to be reacting to a lot more, you know, about history. If you have something you want me to react to, you think that would be really, really smart. Um... Uh, yeah, just, you know, give me a comment, you know, uh, let me know what you think about this video and let me know what you want me to, you know, react to. Uh, I think my next one's going to be the Brothers Grashi, but yeah, it's very interesting how history is shaped by, you know, different peoples and, you know, like even one person, you know, so if you feel you can't change the world, you can't change the world, but maybe not like Napoleon, but maybe in a positive way. Thank you for tuning in. Peace and light. Peace and love. Bye-bye. <laughs>